It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Khalil, um, for inviting me to be in conversation with you. Um, I mean, maybe one good place to start is that sort of connects both of our practices in a way, is sort of the notion of site. Um, site as in location. Um, for those who aren't aware, Dear Art Foundation um, is a museum that actually um, is made up of 12 different sites and locations, sort of this idea of um, working with artists um, who have developed permanent artworks that are sited in a specific place, such as Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty, um, and sort of iconic works of land art such as that. Um, but this notion of site and site specificity um, also operates within sort of a gallery space as well in terms of artists who consider um, the place in which they're working around the decisions they're making around the art that they're showing, our new art that they're making um, to respond to that particular architecture or to the history of the location in which the work is being shown or to the or in terms of the regional population or the geography or various social, social and cultural conditions that um, might inform um, the presentation. And I bring this up because it's interesting that Khalil's project is on view here and simultaneously he has a show in St. Louis, um, two areas that in hearing his biography um, have a resonance to his personal story. Um, so I'm assuming that when you were working across um, both St. Louis and here at the Nerman in Kansas City, that there was some sense of um, responding to some of these histories, be they personal, be they geographic, um, cultural, or otherwise. So I'm curious to hear about, yeah, how you approached this exhibition in terms of the context of Kansas City. I know the title um, may be a little bit of a reference there as well. So yeah, this notion of sight, this notion of response to sort of a local um, context or milieu. Thank you all for being here and for everybody watching on Zoom. It's pretty amazing to be back on the stage here at the Nerman, especially with Jordan. Jordan and I are both from St. Louis. But to be honest, when you think about sight or a response to creating the exhibition that was downstairs, I carry a lot of baggage. I got to be honest. I'm going to be, I'm kind of vulnerable, and sometimes I am, and sometimes I'm not. There's some things I'll tell you, some things I won't tell you. But yeah, I carry a lot of baggage. So the exhibition, in some ways, responds to my time as a student. It includes a few objects in the installation that were made when I was a student. There were things that I wasn't taught about when I was a student or wasn't like a part of the curriculum. So when I had the chance to be able to acquire the David Drake vessel that's downstairs, signed March 12, 1857, 164 years later, I buy my studio in St. Louis on the same day. Um, so there's like this kind of lofted or kind of poetic relationship between uh, the disparate things in the exhibition that either are biographical or super personal, uh, but that kind of still have a social implication or a social resonance that can kind of be expanded on beyond my position or my place as a person. Having shown at the Nerman before in 2017, in that exhibition, I think it was five discrete objects that were presented that had fragments and uh, sections or parts of my studio in, in, the, in the sculptures themselves. But one of the sculptures that was in that presentation was um, in commemoration of a place that's not too far from here called Lucas, Kansas. And Lucas, Kansas is a place, is a town where artists live for a hundred, like a hundred some odd plus years, maybe over almost 200 years. And it's like, a very special location. So to think about how that sculpture and the series of sculptures that were presented in that installation could be expanded on, this exhibition kind of operates as if this, like segments and fragments of my mind. And in terms of what you're saying about vulnerability, um, it's cu I'm curious because this idea of disclosure, but also opacity and sort of how you are directing the gaze and how close like these, when you're going through sort of the parkour or the staging of the exhibition, you sort of feel sort of an embodied sense of proximity, but also remove. Um, so I'm curious around, you know, how you, how that might have affected that, that this idea of, you know, what you, how you are positioning your artwork in relationship to say your personal biography versus maybe larger, um, more cultural or universal associations that one might have and how you're thinking about how you're positioning the body in relationship to moments in which you know the view, the viewer is invited to touch and have sort of a 
a tactile, maybe even sensual relationship with an object, and then moments where you can only see something at a distance and can only imagine what um, another side of it might look like. You only have access to one sort of view that you're sort of determining or dictating through the exhibition sonography. So I'm, I guess I'm just asking around how you are positioning yourself and your artworks in relationship to a viewer's access. Hmm. I mean, it was really determined after coming to see the gallery and having had worked on so many disparate parts, but when they came here, the scale shifted. Um, the amount of, or surplus of things was not as much of a surplus once it entered the room. So then how does one kind of negotiate that dealing with architecture, furniture, and the, the kind of architectural mass or volume that it takes up versus the, the, the things that are situated next to it? It was really a response and relationship between me and the objects, but also all the people who are also working on it. Um, the parts kind of came together with uh, not just my opinion, but all of our opinions in a lot of ways. I mean, I think there were some decisions that I had made, like the big boulder um, in the middle of the gallery was originally gonna be suspended in air, uh, but we changed our minds, or I changed my mind, and I was like, well, it's not gonna be a place like this, but then someone suggested another move, and then we um, built this huge wall in the back gallery for the large video work, which is about a half an hour long, and the iceberg was originally gonna be placed in this gallery. We worked extensively on um, Zoom, and we drew, Andrew and I drew and redrew the, the floor plan over and over and over, but when it came to installing the work, uh, the original ideas had to be as, I think when we think, when I think about Proximity, I think about reflexivity. So it, uh, come, the installation had to come or be born out of a kind of moving of a muscle. And we were all parts of that muscle. Um, and in the end, I think some of the decisions had to just, were made uh, because of the expansion and the contraction of us working and being present together. Maybe I can just d uh, drive in a little bit harder there around the, because it's like, it's very, it's, it's unconventional to walk into an exhibition and have, you know, this staging or this scaffolding that sort of determines where you can go or how close you can get to something. Like there's a real sense of specificity in terms of proximity or lack thereof um, and sight lines and sort of, you know, you're sort of dictating, you know, the politics of viewership in a way. Right. And I guess I'm curious around what, where that decision emerged in terms of, you know, you're not just walking into the gallery, you're walking into a constructed platform that you have, you know, decided that that is the way in which the viewer will navigate, if right. you will. Well, earlier you made reference to an artist named Carl Andre, and I positioned the floor sculpture that's here in the presentation. Uh, this sculpture and many other sculptures similar to it are, by many people, are referred to or thinking that I'm referencing um, Car Andre, but it's not numerical. The only rule to this work is that the, the tiles that have objects embedded in them can not really necessarily sit side by side with another tile with objects embedded in it, if it's like something that looks like a found object. So it's a, that's like kind of the only rule. There's no numbers on the back, there's no structure in a way, but, the, but they're really relating to ancient mosaics. And in 2014, I'm going to skip ahead in the slides. In 2014, when I studied abroad in Jerusalem, I took a couple of buses and some friends of mine and I went to the Church of Nativity, which is what you see on the screen. And in the, when, you, when you approach the Church of Nativity, it's just a church. It's just church doors. Not a lot of people. But when you entered the church, the church was covered in the scaffolding that you see in this picture from, I think, the year uh, four years earlier. Uh, then my arrival, but they were uh, excavating and conserving the mosaics that were on the floor of the church. And this is the church where it's built on the grounds where Jesus is known to be born. Uh, and I was taken by that presentation. And then the 
that's 2014 and then 2016 I studied abroad in Venice and I got to go into many churches and I saw all the beautiful mosaics and marble in the floors of the churches there and I don't know if any of you know this but in many Italian churches um, the people who worked in a church like the priests and things like that are buried below the marble floor in the nave so when you see cult skulls and crossbones in the church floor, that is where someone's person was. And so when I think about these presentations, like the presentation here in St. Louis or in here in Kansas City and the work in St. Louis, uh, positioning the viewer in a place where you see things from above is almost like me recalling these memories in these places. So the association of putting the floor sculpture uh, next to the platform, but just out of step is similar to seeing the mosaics in the church here where you see the people conserving them uh, standing. Unfortunately, they're standing on them, but they're also probably wearing protective gear, so they're not affecting the mosaic, but uh, it's just like kind of recalling those kinds of experiences that I've already had in my life. And it's like a kind of folding poetry that doesn't necessarily, it's almost like the, it's almost like I'm doing a fresh stick writing of my own work without any words. Like, or not, no, what is it when you make up your own kind of shapes that look like letters, but they're not real letters? It's kind of like, it's the part, of, it's like something that Glenn Ligon has been like really committed to doing in his most recent work. And it relates to this kind of legibility, illegibility. It's, and in and, and that kind of, twist of that relationship of access and inaccess it's just like a I don't know I want to say something I want to say something else like when I was a student um, when I was a student in Kansas City one of my professors told me that I didn't know what a void was and then in my artist statement she told me that I didn't know what like it didn't make sense for me to write that my work was an everlasting feedback loop into itself but this project, thinking about it as like the facets of my mind uh, and the facets of my interests or the facets of the things that have inspired me through the years, um, it is really much, it is very much that. Yeah, it definitely feels like a web of references and um, associations, some of which are cryptic, but also in so many ways generous as well. Um, and I want to return uh, to something you were just talking about, and it relates to the experience I had walking through the exhibition earlier today, is that, and I'm really fixating on this exhibition design, or not exhibition design, it's sort of a part of the exhibition itself, this sort of staging, uh, this sort of scaffolding. And as I was walking through it, you know, I became very acutely aware of my steps and like of my body and its limits, um, and sort of looking down towards objects and thinking about sort of the ground and thinking about pedestrian space, you know, thinking about the spaces in which we walk on. Um, and a lot of what you were just talking about in terms of um, these spaces where, you know, there's such, you know, care and reverence for what is on the ground or underneath the ground um, seems like, you know, in many ways that your work or in this exhibition in particular, there's maybe a dichotomy or, not, or a dialectic between the value systems of like pedestrian space and the sort of the meanings or associations that we might ascribe to say the sky or something like this, like a space of aspiration versus a space of existence or the street as maybe a site of struggle or a site of something that um, is potentially neglected or overlooked in the case of your objects that um, are often sort of simulating or replicating uh, detritus or things that might have been cast off. So maybe, I'm just curious yet to maybe dive, dig in a little bit into this um, opposition, perhaps, that I'm reading between the space of the ground or the street or what is below us and the space of what is above us, physically I, and metaphorically, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I see the ground and the sky. I think, I, I think about this all the time and I say this to myself all the time as these sites are uh, parentheses to our physical being. So they can be excavated or be used in a multitude of ways that can never really be used up because they're almost, like, the, like asphalt road can constantly be engineered to be functional. It can constantly be engineered to keep going when you're driving on highways and interstates. It's like, 
you're up on a hill and you can see 10 feet in the in in front of you but then you'll be there at one time you'll be there in a moment if you continue to stay in motion or you can stay still and i think the same for the sky like i i remember the first time i got on an airplane and it really blew my mind i'd never been on a plane i think i finished my first year at school here at the art institute in kansas city and then i went home and i got on a plane to go to new york for the for the first time in 2011 and I had n- never seen like that space, and it was just an, it was just um, it was jolting. It was jolting to see the ground being partitioned by the road, but at that scale, it's almost like now that I'm about to, I'm about to say this like I've never thought of it this way either. It's like a mosaic. You know, it's like a non-linear pattern that's partitioning the the earth. But when you get close to it, it's like this, and from above, it's also still, it's like, it's in motion, but it's microscopically in motion. And it's this like zoom in and zoom out that just holds so much weight. No, that's interesting. I mean, there's a few things operating in my head right now around what you're saying, um, which goes a little bit back to this idea of the void, but also you know, connects a lot to the space of the digital or the virtual in terms of these kind of impossible spaces or spaces of nothingness, but also spaces of, you know, incredible possibility. Um, sort of these intangible spaces that can't can't quite be, compre- you, one cannot quite comprehend um, that seem endless in some, in some regard. Um, so maybe, I mean, that might lead me, could you maybe bring up the image of the monument piece in the lobby? Because that piece, is directly sort of linking to this idea of the void um, in a way that I found quite compelling, um, also because of the minimal form of the object that um, you know speaks a lot to the vocabularies of objects that I work with. Right. Um, so this monochromatic sort of seemingly everyday sort of cylindrical object, um, which is carrying quite a bit of presence, but is entirely empty, which is something that you want to really point to is the fact that it's hollow, um, but also that this structure appears like it could be, you know, that something was once there that right. maybe occupied this space that, you know, has been removed or maybe something is maybe going to go in its place. It's yep. sort of a proxy object, a stand in for a monument to come or a future to be, um, to be built that has not yet arrived yet. Um, and then you have this flag hovering above it, um, referencing a nation that too does not necessarily exist or maybe it does exist and, the, the, the inhabitants of that nation are unknown to us. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, how you're employing the void here in relationship to sort of speculative possibilities of the future. Um, I mean, one part about this sculpture is that there's been so many monuments that have been decommissioned across states, and a lot of them have either been covered up or boxed in. So it's been interesting to kind of revisit that while working on an exhibition with Hamza Walker at MOCA LA next fall which is about those decommissioned monuments, and I'm one of the 10 artists that have been asked to make a work for the exhibition. And I mean, that, there's also a spot in St. Louis where there was a Christopher Columbus sculpture, and but the pedestal still lives there, but there's nothing necessarily on the pedestal. But when you look at it from a certain vantage point, the sky is what's on the sculpture, on the sculptural pedestal. So it's just been something like this, the, person who supported the exhibition building clay products uh, but his the owner of the company's name is um how am i missing his name in my head right now it's so crazy but they they've been wanting me to come work at the factory and i don't want to go work at the factory necessarily because most people who work at this factory they decorate the pipe and i wanted to use the pipe as an object and they're like, oh, you should come and glaze them next time you need to glaze them. And um, I'm like, I don't want to glaze it necessarily. I just want to see like, what do they look like when they populate space? I don't have a chance, like I don't have a studio. I have a big studio at home, but I don't have a studio like the Nerman. So this also, one part about this exhibition is that a lot of the things that people are seeing are opportunities of risk taking and chances. I'm taking chances to do things that I wouldn't necessarily be able to do anywhere else without 
the support of the team here. So moving this pipe into the museum and providing um, this kind of moment for blackness to exist, not necessarily solely tied to race, but it's able to kind of be prominent. Like this laying this pipe down on this ground is able to uh, kind of assert a certain level of presence uh, that um, many objects have taken this space and been presented in this space. But I've also suffered like dealing with like a lot of loss in my life. And I'm not necessarily equating blackness to mourning, but the space that this object is able to occupy, it can occupy some of, it can hold some of those things for me without necessarily having to um, speak directly to them. You left me with a lot there. I mean, I wanna go back to this idea of the decommissioned monuments though. I'm not gonna ask, to ask you to reveal what you're making for this much anticipated exhibition. Well, what um, I'm working on, but. I'm working with the Emancipation Monument. So I'm very interested in Archer Alexander, the black man who's depicted in the 19, well, 1867 or 64 monument. He was enslaved in St. Louis and he was forced to make bricks. So I've been keeping going back and forth with the museum and Hamza Walker because I really would like to present a work with bricks and I wanted to make something so monumental that Abraham Lincoln kind of shied away. And then I created a pedestal or a platform that the viewer or the audience could get up onto and would be able to look directly in the face of Archer Alexander, humanizing him despite him being kneeling, a kneeling figure in the, the larger sculpture. And so right now I'm like, I haven't really, I've, I have to meet with them again to talk about the budget and stuff. So the, I mean, that is an exhibition too that has like gone through maybe two or three different revisions of what I'm doing. And, but right now I want to make, like, I don't mind divulging because it might well, change again. Yeah. I mean, I guess I wasn't really going to ask about the specific specificity of that project, but more largely, I'm curious what your take is on, because I've thought about this a bit myself around, you know, decommissioned monuments and, you know, do we, in the idea of new monuments, is it that we need alternative monuments or is it that monuments themselves, um, you know, are something that we should, you know, sort of move beyond in terms of, of, of that vocabulary, um, which made me think about, you know, this idea of what is there when you remove the monument and in some ways it's just the pedestal or the plinth or whatever the infrastructure or ground is that sort of held up this thing and in that space of the void, that would be like one can project or imagine whatever they'd want to onto there, that it doesn't need to be defined and it could be something that anyone could project onto it. Um, it's something that has often come into my head. So I was just curious to think about, yeah, what is your thought on the replacement of monuments? I mean, it's hard because those objects were put there and made in, mom in, in time. Yeah. And now we're like working on revising time that's already passed. It's, I don't know. It's like hard to like when you like the system has been working in a certain way up to this point and we want to change the way we want to change what we know of the past to kind of make a new or a different present. But I don't I don't really know. It's really complicated because I mean and you say that the exhibition is quite anticipated but one part of the exhibition that's really complicated is Kara Walker got a sculpture that she could melt down and reuse. So it's like the show is going to do that. It's going to deal with everything that you're asking. And I, I'm honored to be able to be a part of it. Um, but I think the, the way to deal with what you're asking is going to only be through time because there are gonna be people making new monuments, there are gonna be new commissions, there are gonna be, life is still lifing while we're living, you know? So it's like hard to, like I don't, I don't know if, mm. I don't necessarily know if there's a right or a wrong way to deal with it because people ultimately are gonna have, there are some people who are gonna put the choice to a public there are some choices being made that are going to go to a private place. Like some of the monuments are being repositioned in racist institutions that don't necessarily care about telling the truth about those objects, but are going to continue to use them and uphold them to kind of reinvigorate their vile tr communication with an audience. Uh, and then some of them are going to go into basements and be unknown or forgotten in a certain capacity. And that, you know, and is that, that's not necessarily educational or helpful, 
when so many people ignore the past that we're all inheriting and living through. Um, so it's quite complicated. No, yeah, what you raise is interesting. I mean, I also, you know, I don't necessarily have a position because it is interesting to think about all of the various possibilities and how we, I guess, we will explore and iterate in real time and see what that future looks like. But sort of in terms of this idea of, you know, what happens to, you know, just because you take it off view doesn't mean it doesn't exist anymore. Right. I'm curious about the way in which you sort of trace and sort of index and sort of um, expose, if you will, like the social life of objects. Um, because like it, this one. Uh, oh, yeah, there, there we go. <laughs> there we go. It's a perfect one to sort of um, get into. And you were just talking about some serendipity around the date on its inscription, which I, you had not mentioned before. Which yeah. is, did it's you know that special. when you purchased? No, you, you yeah. Go, no, t- I Tell us know. about this object. Well, I went to, I don't remember. I did like three trips back to back, and I knew this object was coming up to auction. And I was in Cincinnati while a friend was getting married, and I bought it like one, I think, the night that we came back to the residence after the wedding. Um, but I just, I'd been searching and like watching several of them that have come up to auction. And this, I just, I don't know if it was a free accident or You just what. share what it is just so everyone... So the object that we're looking at is a work uh, made by a man who was enslaved, and his name was David Drake. His inherited name was David Drake. Um, some people know him as Dave the Potter, but he was enslaved um, on the East Coast, and later in his life he worked on making these storage vessels. Some of them are up to 25 gallons, so they're quite massive objects. He uh, knew how to read and write despite it being against the law. He had this practice of engraving or carving text into the surface of the vessels, either uh, marking the date, his name, poetry, drawings. There's one that's about to come up for auction that has a drawing of a bird on it, which is quite amazing to think that despite the infrastructural and the, the, the architecture in which he lived in, he was able to... Um, that we still are able to have a record of his presence uh, because a lot of the objects that he made are destroyed and a lot of the objects that you may see in a public space are actually in parts or they are majorly damaged. Like the one at Crystal Bridges is massive, but there's maybe a quarter to a third of its form broken off. And my sculpture, my object is actually in full, fully intact. But unfortunately, mine is, does not have a signature on it, but it does. Uh, it is on a record of extant objects that are made by him, which is tremendous. I started making uh, when I was 12. I started making pottery when I was 12. So it's like quite beautiful that 20 years later, I'm able to buy an object um, that has such historical resonance and pertinence, but also relates to another part of my studio practice where I collect molds of vessels that were made between like the 60s, 70s, and 80s for hobbyists to produce things and produce ceramics. And then I go to museum collections and try to find other examples of a similar form and maybe try to make a connection between these hobbyist mold forms and a historical object. I think this like record or kind of mining kind of exists between, like you were mentioning a few minutes ago, the digital and the physical. But a mold is a, is a mold shows the vacancy of an object that has to be made into existence. Um, and I think that's one of the most beautiful things about ceramics as a material to work with. There are a few, uh-oh. Uh, There are a few ceramic sculptures in this exhibition, but in contrast to the presentation in St. Louis, um, so the presentation in St. Louis is this built platform originally conceived for the Walker Art Center where Jordan previously worked, and we skipped through some of the slides of Jordan's projects that were there, um, but we both have a relationship to this institution and this, um, the pipe, you were asking about the pipe in a more kind of direct um, comment about the pipe is it's a, the the pipes were cut at a certain height because they could be fifth, 14 feet tall. They were cut to the six, six, seven, six and a half, seven foot tall area because the weight of them, they're 3,800 pounds. There's that, that black form there is 3,800 pounds. And if it was any taller, the weight would have displaced the terrazzo floor at the museum. 
Uh, so, I mean, I wish that for the Nerman that we could have had a taller sculpture. We may not have necessarily been able to lift it up into place uh, because weight uh, and scale take different uh, tools to move around. Uh, but this exhibition is really working to be the opposite of this project. Uh, that's super. I, I, I like what you said there around this weight that it would have broken the terrazzo floor because it makes me think about, you know, encumbrance because what you are doing in many ways in, in this show, in the Walker show, and also in this show, and in St. Louis, presumably, um, is that you're populating the space with like an overwhelming amount of information um, from these archives that you're calling from the internet, from your personal life, from these objects with deep provenance and histories, um, and sort of a general sense of um, the heaviness of, of, of black life and perhaps just of one's own memory, of one's own longing, of all of these various um, um, associations, if you will. And there is this sense of encumbrance, of, of in implicating an institution to host all of this stuff. Right. Um, Amongst that, all the other yeah. things that the institution already holds. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just that makes me think of an artist's work that I want to just beat back to real quick is I got to see uh, one of Jordan's projects at DIA and the Stanley Brown exhibition was quite uh, profound and beautiful that when you walked into the gallery, it, you know, presumably looked empty. But really the artist was asking you to pay a little bit more attention to your surroundings. And when you looked down, the artist told you to walk a certain distance and related these two different things to each other or these two places to each other. And so I, you know, I think we talked about, you know, how are we going to be able to bring this all together? But, you know, I think some of the projects that Jordan, too, has made has just been a great dialogue, even though we have never been in conversation before or necessarily talked or done a studio visit before. Um, I don't know if it's like what's in the water or is it because we're from St. Louis that we think about an art, we think about the, poli the political architecture of how space can be used or formed. And then with your practice of dealing with artists and working with living and uh, artists that have since transitioned, uh, stewarding their interest in space, uh, it's just like a, it's just a really beautiful connection and, and that's really why I asked to speak with you yeah and you know the Stanley Brown exhibition just to quickly give a bit of context um, the reason that that slide is ostensibly blank with just the artist's name in lowercase Helvetica is because he was a radical um, conceptual artist who did not um, want to represent his objects. He did not want any photography of the work, any reproduction of the work. He did not want his biography associated with the work, no writing and no written interpretation, no bibliography. Um, and that was sort of a core ethic of the work. And what was important to me in doing this show um, was that you know the institution could host this, um, what we might call today like this act of refusal, um, which really sort of, you know, upends you know all sort of institutional habit code and convention around the scaffolding if you will around an exhibition um and the type of information that one as a visitor like expects to have it as an entry point to the work um but there are various reasons that he did this such as the fact that the work is all about measurement and distance and the way in which one sort of um moves through and occupies time and space and therefore really believe that any visitor could really had all of the tools that they needed in which to have a direct experience, an unmediated experience with the work, which is something that um, the institution I work at now, Dia Art Foundation, as part of their mission, is really thinking about unmediated experiences with art, um, which goes a little bit of back to what, you know, to your exhibition, which kind of, you have sort of taken it upon yourself to create your own mode of mediating your own work. And that's sort of why in the beginning of this conversation, I think I was compelled to ask you so much about the scaffolding is because in many ways it functions as its own way of determining how you want a viewer to see your work um, within this institutional space and perhaps taking back some of that agency, if you will, around the contextualization or the choreography around your work. And also just also trying to get the museum or the institution that I'm working with to do as much as we possibly can. Some of the interpretation for the exhibition is translated in Spanish, some of it's translated into uh, Braille, and it kind of came about through 
the making of the work that a lot of these things kind of also blossomed which is like in compare is in relationship or in similarity to Stanley Brown and in in complete opposition or kind of the far extreme to what he was doing you know and I, I Jordan also worked on a beautiful exhibition with the now recently passed Richard Hunt who's an artist who's a legend you know a massive like I mean I didn't we never I didn't learn about Richard Hunt when I was a student but I knew I have come to know who he was and where he worked and how he worked and he was like able to just like he's one person that I know or who I've learned to know is like one black person one black artist who's been to, able to always be an artist never doing it never doing anything else but always being able to keep a studio practice and that's been a huge inspiration for me and I think taking the risks that I'm taking downstairs to try things and expand on what I've learned or thought about as art. Um, no, Richard is, you know, he was a true, he is a legend, but he was a living legend up until just late last year and actually just opened an exhibition in New York at a, Early Works. Of Early Works from at White Cube Gallery. Um, and I wish he could have been there to see it. Um, and it's his last major show in New York was in 1972, and many of those works are actually on view there, but that was actually the first show by an um, African-American sculptor to be shown at the Museum of Modern Art, and this was 1972. Um, and, you know, it, I think, you know, it's interesting to think about that because it says a lot around issues of institutional neglect and, you know, the way in which, you know, many artists are not able to see, you know, these moments of recognition because they come all too late. So I was very happy to be able to support that work during my time at the Art Institute. And actually, if you go to the slide before, this slide here um, was a particularly proud moment and it relates to what we were talking about earlier a bit about monuments and sort of, you know, how to occupy sort of very privileged points um, in public space or sort of our, or in, in sort of these architectures, these social architectures, such as um, the Grand Staircase of the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, my boss at the time, Ann Goldstein, uh, when I started at the Art Institute of Chicago, we were considering, you know, how can we you know, have a new handshake to this museum. You know, when you walk into this museum um, off of um, Michigan Avenue and you look up this, you know, this marble presenting staircase, um, you see, you saw this sort of decapitated, head, <laughs> headless, armless, legless bust of a woman. And we're thinking, you know, is this really the most, you know, welcome, like, is this really the handshake that we want for the 21st century, like to this museum? And the answer was no. And then it was like, well, what else can go here? You know, this idea of taking something off few, well, what happens? So this artist, Richard Hunt, was a, le is, was a legendary um, sculptor. And this sort of marked the very first time that a contemporary artwork had held this privileged position, if you will. And it was so, perfect in a way because it's a piece called Hero Construction from 1958 that was actually made the year after um, Richard had graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So again, this idea of context in relationship to like putting something in a place where it has particular resonance to that history was important. But again, it's a sculpture or this idea of a hero or a monument that is made out of recycled car parts. Um, so the, sort of this assemblage of junk to create this figure that is um, both a sign of, um, of, of strength and resilience um, that really became you know, an, an iconic piece in, in the collection when it was resuscitated and brought to this point and it still stands there today. And so that's something I was very proud to be a part of and um, in terms of valorizing this artist's um, work, but who was already valorizing sort of you know, refuse material, which is something that in many ways you do um, in your work in a very different sort of material vocabulary. So all of these interesting <laughs> linkages and references and, and this network of, uh, of, of images that we're talking about. I mean, I also want to return back to something that you said earlier. You know, you're putting, you put the Richard Hunt right here in the middle of the staircase. In my exhibition downstairs, like, I don't mind if you miss things. You know, I think that there's like, moments of like passing by that not everything will be seen but there's a open sign downstairs and when the exhibition is open 
the light is on. When the exhibition is closed, the light is off. And when you go in there, you can gather as much as you can, or you can speculate as much as you can, or you can admire as much as you can, or you can deny and dis like dislike whatever you want, you know, in a way, but it's still there and it's still present. Um, and in a way, it almost acts like a like diary in a way. You know, there's definitely power in the periphery. And I think that is also something I did note in your exhibition was these moments where objects appear in places that are sort of kind of outside of a sight line or in a place where you would not imagine um, an art object to be or, you know, where you're like, oh, is that is that an art object? You're like, what is that? Something that's almost at the height of a freeze, like this fragment of a sky and this sort of architectural fragment that you've put um, above a threshold. Um, and I think that's something I'm drawn to in many artists' works is, you know, how can you in many ways, it does two functions. You know, there is a power in you know being in spaces that cannot be seen but still hold presence, and there's also something around the ability to reorient one's um, ways of looking to look towards the spaces that they might not normally look at. Um, so there is a drawing attention away from the center to the periphery that can also be a powerful gesture. Thank you so much. It's been really wonderful. But I would love to know if anybody has any questions. Yeah. So, um, well, thank you. You all have left us with so much to think about. So, um, I'm going to ask a question that I hope doesn't come off as slightly dumb, but it strikes me that there's a lot of photography and a lot of um, sort of imagery that pulls from the world in so many different ways. And um, I wonder if you could kind of reflect on image gathering, um, because what's been so interesting in your conversation is you've talked so much about kind of materials gathering and um, the, the, you know, the, the sort of extraordinary reflections on the floors, but there's this incredible horizontal or vertical element that's like a kind of rich image world. Thank you. Um, this uh well thank you uh in the presentation i'm presenting the first like large long 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 movie thing kind of like that i made i've never made anything like this before but this work is a commemoration of a, a vacation that a relative of mine probably would never had been able to take um photography i don't necessarily want to say photography but i i'll say uh, engaging in the lens or the screen. It's more like screen based, not necessarily, I, I take photographs of things, but I would say that it's screen based works. Uh, they, the paintings come from screen, images on the sculptures come from screen, the objects uh, or the exhibition in itself was kind of constructed through the screen. Um, so it's just a kind of condition of contemporary life in a way. I think it, operates as like this second eye or third eye or fourth eye of place that keeps things for me that it's like my second brain where I can hold a, a even more robust repository of all the things that I think about. Um, Joanne mentioned an exhibition that I had three years ago now at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, that exhibition uh, populated images from the floors to this almost to the ceiling of the gallery and presented five sculptures that had images on the surfaces of them. The images on the surfaces of the sculptures kind of exist there because I'm interested in the evolution of ceramic material possibilities in terms of image transfers specifically. I'm like not making spaceship tiles or anything like that. It's like not that revolutionary or that uh, in, in um, investigatory but the images on the walls had a specific kind of architecture that ex existed in a certain landscape. There were sections, cross sections of the ground that related to the position the viewer was standing on in the museum floor, on the museum floor. And when you looked up, the images from the ground to the ceiling, the sky, the starry space above us, uh, kind of populated the collages at the top, but they had a lot of uh, digital residue still in them. 
And so what you're seeing in this exhibition, like this work is almost like I made this part of the installation for someone who uses different mobility devices. So part of this exhibition is made for people who operate in the world in a different way. If they see this show or not, that's okay. You know, but it's about also making for different perspectives to see. So this work is made to where if you're riding in a wheelchair or walking uh, with a walker, the way you engage this image, it kind of can act like how uh, images kind of, uh, it's almost cinematographic in a way. And I'm like, is that possible? Can I make something that does that? And like the goal of some of these works are to try to engage in a different way. So like, yeah, so I like, I appreciate your your like acknowledgement of photography, like thinking of it as photography. And then it's like, for me, I'm not like, when I studied art history, I studied uh, outsider art. You know, and I don't really necessarily like that terminology, but there are uh, four memory jugs in the exhibition, and those memory jugs are made by people I don't know. But to give them place uh, in this exhibition is a way to think about legacies and histories of black people in this country who uh, used a myriad of ways of memorializing space or uh, decorating or engaging their architecture to make their space their own. You know, I make wallpapers uh, works and I make uh, the collages on the sculptures of my objects referring to and referencing the practice of covering the interior of uh, black people several decades to year, 100 years ago, decorating the interior of their homes with uh, newspapers to keep spirits busy. You know, so in a way, like, I'm not necessarily divulging all my information to you because I'm not, I don't have to because it's not necessarily, some of the information in the work isn't for you. So that's another way why I change it from photography because it's not about a setting or a place to be legible. It's about holding space for your legibility. That I, that, that's like, then I go to screen because like so many things operate in the internet that we don't necessarily also access at any given moment. But it also, everything in the exhibition is rendered still. Whereas on the internet, once you activate the screen, it becomes in motion. So it's kind of weird. We have another question back here. You talked earlier about uh, talking about the monuments. You talked about building a brick structure so the uh, viewer can go up and be close. Um, within this um, gallery, you have interactive exhibits where you can touch. How did you decide what people could touch and what was that thought process with the sand and the sculpture and uh, the other the other things that you could touch in there? Uh, I especially like the uh, camera where you can set your camera down as well. Ooh, cool. I'm glad you like that. I'm glad you like that. You were mentioning this diorama in the distance. This work was made to commemorate uh, a billboard, a miniature billboard for the woman who helped me, who works at a bank that helped me buy my house and my studio. And they specifically work with black people to be able to buy their first homes. Uh, it's a community financial development institution. So I wanted to give space for Janine in the show. The stone work, the two stone works, you know, I, I was telling Jordan the and the big pipe in the lobby. Uh, you can't necessarily destroy them with your bare hands. So why not give you the capability to touch them? Um, again, I did it cause I could, <laughs> I did it cause I had to, you know, I had to, I have to do this exhibition to be able to do my next one. And I could set these things up in my studio, but it would not be the same. Uh, I also, you know, Johnson County Community College is an educational environment. So just as much as I'm on my journey to learn and keep living as an artist or as a person or as a black man in this country, um, you know, this exhibition and people who are able to see it and interact with it and touch it like you are, uh, are able to kind of be on that journey with me. One more question, I think, for the professor. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you, Jordan. It's a remarkable exhibition. I mean, I've seen, you know, probably every exhibition in the Nerman, and I've never seen one like this. So my 
congratulations on stretching the institution, stretching the, the audience. Talk about the wall labels, please. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, I really appreciate your note. As Bruce and Art left earlier, um, you know, when I was a student, I never got to see a show at the Nerman. It wasn't until after I graduated that I got to come here because I didn't have a car when I was a student. The labels uh, kind of operate in that, like, in that complicated zone of like, make an exhibition too didactic, make an exhibition not didactic at all, and like, uh, give no labels, give no information. Um, the labels were born really out of the artwork. Like the artworks born why some of the things had to be the way they were. Um, so, uh, but I also know the population here at JCC. And so I wanted to create two labels in English and Spanish so that people didn't have to strain too hard. Like, you're like it's already going to be hard enough for you when you walk through the show. I hope giving you some English, you know, wall labels will help it a little bit more. Uh, but it was also an exercise for me to deal with. Uh, interpretation so how things were interpreted into braille and interpreted into Spanish had multiple meanings and we had to choose one it was a wrestle you know and that as an exercise so if the whole exhibition is an exercise in perception place positionality um, it was also an exercise for me in position to language that then could or could not expand on parts of what we were dealing with and uh, I appreciated that as an opportunity because um, it really some of the things that I wanted to realize didn't get to necessarily be realized in the way that I uh, had thought about it and so what do I take uh, away from dealing with language as another way to reinterpret or re-engage with some of that content so I, I hope uh, I hope it's refreshing but also a learning experience for other people who are working on exhibition making to kind of expand on that especially here in Kansas City where it's just like the population is booming, you know, with people from all over the place. Thank you. We got one last question over here. Hey, thank you. There was one ceramic object that or artwork that y'all had brought up that you brought and that you bought an auction that you were showing. I was curious of that piece. It looked like uh, it was on like a stonework there was yeah um and you were saying it was made and it didn't show the the um, the stitching that's on the side there is that the signature on the side or is this the piece without the his work on it yeah i'll break it down so these uh three dots here and these two slashes relate to a kind of uh what was either stored in the object or um kind of relate to its function this L and the M is the enslaver's initials. And then this is March 12th, 1857. Wow, I just really admired that piece right there. I wanted to ask you a little bit about it and see what it was supposed to intend to look like right there. So. Yeah, it's a four gallon storage vessel. Oh, four gallon, that's bigger than I thought it was gonna be. Yeah, it's but 40 inches in uh, circumference. Uh, it could have held water. It could have held um, grain. It would not have necessarily held, uh, obviously, too much because it's of its of its size. But um, you know, they were covered so that they could so the things inside wouldn't necessarily spoil. But oh. this, for me, is an example of early industrial production in the United States. You know, where we think of industrial production. Uh, in terms of ceramic, uh, as like for me, I think about the legacies of European appropriative ceramics, and we bring like white dishware to the United States or what is to become the United States. But alongside of these European decorative ceramics on boats and ships, there were also human beings on those boats and ships. And then those people on the boats and ships came to this land for their skills. 
People think, and there's all this lore, that people who were enslaved were dumb and stupid and animals, which was wrong. People were gathering people from the African continent for their skilled labor. When you think about wrought iron gates throughout the South and the Midwest, uh, structures that have been used to segregate communities, the labor that was used to build those things, the bricks that build St. Louis, Chicago, many places, uh, enslaved labor was used to make these things because of their beauty. If you ever go to the Ulysses S. Grant house in, in, in St. Louis, the wood that was cut and trimmed to build that home was from the labor of people who were enslaved on that land. And so we don't like think about the legacies and the histories of how architectures or spaces kind of exist. And for me, when I think about my my legacy or my connection to the history of ceramic making in through my education or where I want to be like I own this thing because I want to be in proximity to it I put it in the show so that people know that when I'm thinking about stems from this history this historical lineage oh, thank you for breaking that down I just wanted to see that again oh no worries appreciate it and you can see that piece in the exhibition downstairs. Woo!